Bark, 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 bark. Marla was glad dogs can't talk. Happy not to know what his neighbor's dogs were saying. But maybe they were trying to tell him something. The Romanian Brancusi at Smarty's studio. He'd honed in on Brancusi's jacket. Saw Brancusi's bird in space sideways with stick legs that became a headless scapegoat. He'd revisited that amber moment to throw magic dust into the light. And now he saw things he hadn't seen before. He penetrated deeper. He now made out a woman in the amber light. Baroness Rene Irana Frachon, model for the sleeping muse. And how did Brancusi see that face in a piece of stone? How did he get from here to there? Such a mystery. Smarty pretexted the illusion that he was showing Marlowe everything. But there was stuff happening on the third floor. Marlowe couldn't fathom. Perhaps it was the future that chilled Art, made him more discreet. He wouldn't talk about the future. The future was under wraps, like a Cristo. Smitten let him see just a bitty bit, and only for a few seconds would say, Learn to see fast, Marlowe. You see more than you think. But you can't bring it back by will. It will reveal itself when you are ready. You have to have faith. Trust, said Smitten. Trust Smitten? Sure. The word that flashed neon in Marlowe's brain. Peligroso. As to the rooster, it was a truly ugly object. Marlowe's wife often tossed it in the trash. The rooster had to be hidden. Yes, ugly, Marlowe agreed, but oh, when he sings. And you'd think he'd know Chinese since he was manufactured in Sichuan province. But the rooster had only a smattering of Spanish, a few words of French, and had learned English from a clown named Hobbes, a rustic, thus the Cockney accent. And the rooster knew about him, his dancing, and called him a dancing tour de force of satire. Is there such a thing? Was it a compliment? Hard to fathom, but Marlowe appreciated it. Rooster was a self-starter, early to bed, early to rise, a bandy cocky bird with an edge of resentment. You can put on a tie, Marlowe. I am always au trait. Marlowe remembered Smarty saying, sometimes if you get in a corner, it helps to talk. Marlowe was talking about the importance of Max Ernst when the rooster, as it was his wont to do, brought the conversation back to itself. How Milton Ernst, Robert Rauschenberg, anticipated pop. The rooster, essential in the beginning of falling out. Bob hit it big, the rooster not so much. Then Art Smitten. The rooster crowed how Art knew him at sight, knew him from beak to claws, didn't ask for references or provenance or portfolio, and wasn't it providential that Marlowe and the rooster should now be colleagues? Providential how, asked Marlowe. Art's a big deal, said the rooster. He rolls big. It must cost a zillion simoleons to stay as invisible as he does. Marlowe, impatient. What's my job? To deliver the mark to the spot? To be a tour guide to make sure the client sees everything Smarty wants to be seen? Relax, said the rooster. Somebody has to tell the story. Who better than you, Marlowe? At the price. Leave it to a foot-high rooster to take the easy jab. The rooster sweetened. Marlowe, not everyone can talk to me or I to them. It's a skill to talk to an inanimate object, and you never know when that's going to come in handy. They spent a day by the seaside. Marlowe needed to talk. It did him good to talk. Sometimes a case would crack open if he talked. As he laid out the case, they strolled near the water, took pictures, maybe a holiday card. Have a merry COVID Christmas and a rock down lockdown Hanukkah. Nah, no cards this year. This is not right, said the rooster, meaning them. Probably not, agreed Marlowe, but nothing about this year is right. They laughed and took no notice of the tourists looking at them. And what a year. At the end of July, the valley was pink with naked ladies. But everything was bone dry. With August came the fires. Marlowe evacuated his property. All his paintings left behind 
threatened by fire. He stayed strangely calm. He learned what he'd learned. No time for grief or despondency. He envisioned stepping onto an up escalator and thought of John Baldessari burning his early artwork in a mortuary. No more boring art, he wrote. No more boring art. And Marlowe thought, Neon. Bruce Nauman. Mr. Boots and Neon. I can help. Ask me how. Ten cents in a series of flashing colors. Good choice, said the rooster. Thankfully, the fire spared Marlowe's house. The art safe. And plus, he now had a new vision of transmutation. Yes, Marlowe could see a road forward with his painting, but to go through the looking glass to find Smarty, that was another thing. Smarty's art was pure enchantment, but to make that art, there was a price, especially in the dystopic future with Bunny and Bester, where after they put on a show, they sold the sets, the props, and the costumes to art hunters, mostly shady characters who had no idea what they were buying. Last time out, they all got away by the skin of their teeth when some of those investors thought they'd been duped and they had to head to the hills. And then there was the matter of those Franz Klein fruit bat bitter paintings that got back to the present, which meant even more dangerous treasure hunters and art snobs were sure to follow. But the glamorous Smarty, ugh, the tawdry future would need all the glamour it could get. But again, fretted Marlowe, at what cost? And what was Bonga Bonga anyway? A state of mind with a rundown movie studio? Did that make any sense in Love Token Alley, where Bunny and Bester and Smitten were sure to risk it all once again, no matter what the odds, just because they wanted to see what would happen next? He had to admit, why wouldn't they with the promise of Smitten Vision? Now the hallucination would be more real than real. Hope and optimism is what Smitten would say his new work was about. And bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. But again, fretted Marlowe. At what cost? Then Marlowe said out loud, What are you going to do this time, Smarty, when the bill comes due? Sell the bubble machine to some sucker? That seemed to hit a nerve. But all he heard in his head was Smarty saying, Art is magic, Marlowe. Abracadabra. Marlowe looked at the rooster who'd been staring at him. Abracadabra, said the rooster. Cock-a-doodle-doo. That about summed it up. All that was certain was Art Smitten, Art Star, was written out of history, and as to himself, he was perhaps destined to remain forever no more than a sorcerer's apprentice. Humbling, but there it was, and the only thing to do was to dip his brush in the paint pot and keep at it. Marlowe painted Mango Hibiscus, the coat de Banga. Did I roll it or already smoke it? Oh. I guess I did. Amicord, I remember. Blessed is Fellini, who wrote and drew in a dream book. Said Fellini, Casanova wrote his memoirs because he looked back on his life as a failure. If you look at history books, he's not mentioned. If you look at other people's memoirs, he's not mentioned. He is mentioned only by himself. He could not bear dying with the weight of that failure. So he created a fantasy and left behind a life a little more positive. Was that Marlowe? All his energies to rise to the heights only to accomplish nothing? Icarus too thick to know wax melts? Would they see the depths of his artistry? What if they do see and yawn? Epitaph. He did not know how and could not wait to learn. Around this time, he had a dream that turned out to be meaningful. A film festival. Marlowe couldn't get in, no tickets. He finds a side alley, passes through a narrow gate, sees a dirty window, which affords a view of the screen. When he wipes off the dirt, he can see well enough. Someone comes running down the lane towards him. Marlowe fears he's been busted to be unceremoniously escorted out, but no. A thin, polite man in waiter's attire brings a three-legged folding chair and a striped umbrella. Things were looking up. On screen, the camera lingers on a naked woman. No head and no feet in the picture frame. 
Marlow didn't know if the torso or the adored was speaking because he couldn't hear through the glass. He could only read the subtitles. My lover lived in Toronto. The air in Toronto is so dry. Her lips were so awfully chapped. Later in the dream, he encounters Fellini in a public urinal. Fellini spoke in Italian, visible subtitles, Russian, Chinese, French, English. Fellini wags dry while drawing cartoons on the plaster with a grease pen. All the while speaking to the man next to him, we recognize his artist, Piero Manzoni, Mr. 091 himself. Marlowe sidles up to Fellini to tell him how he loved the artificiality where Donald Sutherland as Casanova makes an escape in a rowboat over black sheets of plastic. It was so inventive. Know him, asks Manzoni in Italian. A fan, says Federico, a windbag but harmless, small part actor. Marlowe is taken aback. Didn't they think he could read subtitles? Manzoni says, I think I saw him in a Dada film. He played a dachshund. Yes, a little cigar, says Fellini. And Manzoni says, out of nowhere, Duchamp, Duchamp, Duchamp. Not making any sense until Manzoni says, Tell him he's pissing in the broken urinal. Tell him Duchamp pees on his shoes. Marlowe awoke. He had to pee. Duchamp found pee, the kind of dream Marlowe would dream. Only Marlowe would dream, quoting Duchamp. The audience completes the work of art. Marlowe thinks to tell the rooster about artist whiz, but the rooster would have more likely been interested in what went on in Toronto. But that was not the end of the Duchamp story, and the next day, the meaning of the dream was revealed. Sam Bunny, Lester Bester, and Art Smitten were reuniting. Goat de Bonga, Love Token Alley, Party at Smarties. And Marlowe was being summoned. <laughs>